everyone, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here then my name is Lucy and I'm now a fourth year medical student studying at the University of Nottingham. In today's video I'm going to be talking about the dreaded UCAT. I remember taking the UCAT when I was applying to medical school and honestly I got so nervous about it. It means so so much and it's so important and yet it's such a difficult and scary exam to sit. So I wanted to make this video to give you some tips and help you to prepare. So the way this video is going to work is the first half will be me giving my general and section specific tips of how to approach questions, manage your time, and the second half of the video will be about how you can actually prepare and practice using all of those techniques. So stick around for that. My scores are on the screen now just so that you can see what I got. I won't be talking about the decision making section because I didn't do that in my year, but I will be talking about all the other sections. So let's get started with quantitative reasoning. This is a very, very time pressured section. So you have about 40 seconds per question. So my number one tip for this section, and this pretty much applies to all of the other sections as well, you need to learn how to flag, guess, and move on. So there is a flag feature on the UCAT test where you can flag a question, and then when you get to the end of the section, you can review all of the questions that you've flagged and go back through them. Basically, littered throughout the quantitative reasoning section, there will be some really, really simple questions which only take a few seconds of working out. You can just eyeball the data, you can perform one quick calculation and you can get to an answer. There will also be questions that have loads and loads of steps of working out and are so much more complex and require you to do so much more to get to an answer. So what you need to do is you need to quickly assess a question and you need to decide whether this is something you can work out quickly or whether it isn't. Maybe give it a go and if you think you're going to get to an answer really quickly then keep at it. If you think it's going to take you a while to get to an answer then flag the question and just put a guess in because there's no negative marking so you may as well guess and then move on. This is because all of the questions are worth one mark so basically it's better for you to answer eight questions and get eight marks and then be really really easy simple questions than for you to answer one really difficult question in the same amount of time. My next tip is to practice using the on-screen calculator and this is so important because in the real exam you will not have your own calculator or your phone so don't practice with those. Practice with the on-screen calculator. You need to get really fast and accurate at using this calculator and I would suggest using the keypad on your keyboard rather than tapping on the numbers with your mouse because this will make you so much faster at performing calculations. My next tip is to keep an eye on the time so you want to make sure that you're not regularly going over that 40 second limit that you have for each question because if every question you go over by five seconds you will find that you will run out of time. This doesn't mean that you need to really really stress over it and really stick to this 40 second rhythm rule. I think the way I did it is that I had sort of time landmarks throughout the section. So for example, I wanted to have completed the first five scenarios within the first 10 minutes and then I knew I would be on track. My next tip is to take educated guesses. So in those situations where you do have to just guess an answer because it's going to take you too long to work it out, then try to eliminate answers if you can. If you can eliminate just one option, it will increase the chance of your answer being right by a lot. So if one option seems to be just a bit of an outlier, maybe it's in the wrong units or it's way too big or it's way too small and it's not the kind of answer you were expecting then just rule it out and guess between the others. Obviously the more options that you can eliminate the more likely it is that your guess will be right. Next I think it's sometimes useful to consider whether you can work backwards from the answer options. So if for example you think a question will entail you to sort of make an equation then consider whether it will be quicker to just input the answer options into the question and just see if the numbers work. It might be that the right answer is actually the top answer in the list and so you will then know that that is the right answer straight away if you just input it into the question. This can be a little bit risky though but if you think it's going to be quicker than you actually coming up with an equation then I would recommend giving it a go. My final tip for this section is to be really careful with picking your answers and do not fall into the traps that the examiners will set for you. Every answer in the options will be somehow relevant. So a lot of the answers will be numbers that you will reach at some point in the calculation process but they they won't be the final answer. So it might be, for example, that right at the end you need to convert your units. So don't fall into the trap of seeing a number and recognising it because you've seen it in your calculations and then selecting that. Make sure you're at the end of your calculations before you select the answer. 
Next, let's talk about abstract reasoning. I have three key tips for this section. The first is to have a systematic way of going through all the types of rules that the pattern might be following. So for example, the pattern could relate to the size, the number of objects, the color, the intersections, the position, the direction, the number of angles, the number of sides. And some people say it's really useful to have a mnemonic for this. I think if you went through this for every single question, you would be wasting a lot of time. But for those ones where you get really stuck and you just cannot find a pattern, it might be good to have jotted down on your whiteboard or your piece of paper whatever it is that you get it might be nice to have the mnemonic written down so that if you get completely stuck you can look down and you can see oh yeah I haven't checked for symmetry yet I'm going to check that now and that might be the rule my next tip and I think this is the tip that helped me so so much with abstract reasoning it literally transformed the way that I approach the questions is to always look at the simplest box first some of the rules might be really really complex but some of the rules are actually really simple but there are just a lot of distractor objects in the boxes that are making you confused if you look at the simplest box it can be a lot easier to identify the rule and I have an example here to show you. Now in this example the rule is actually quite an easy one but I just wanted to demonstrate what I mean. So first look at the simplest box. So for example in set B if you looked at the top left corner at the diamond and quickly reel off to yourself all of the rules that may apply to that shape. So for example uh, the rule might be that it has four sides, it has four angles, there is only one shape in the box, all the shapes are white, all the shapes have straight edges, all of the shapes are in that position in the box. And once you've quickly thought of those things, then compare them to other boxes in the set. So for example, if you look across to the black triangle, you will quickly rule out then that the rule cannot be that a shape is white or that it's four-sided or that it's got four angles. It could still be though that the shape has only straight edges. So if you quickly assess through and see if that rule applies to the rest of the set, you will see that that is the rule. And then the other set will often just be the kind of reverse of that rule. So set A is that there are only curved edges. And I just think this is a really good technique to use, especially if you're struggling with abstract reasoning and you're just finding that you, you just can't find the patterns, always start with the simplest box. My final tip for abstract reasoning is that if you're struggling to see a pattern by looking up close and looking at all the finer details, then take a step back obviously you won't be able to physically stand up and get out of your chair but just kind of let yourself lean back a little bit and look at the patterns as a whole because it might be that there's something that really stands out to you when you just sort of take a step back so it might be that you see that there is so many shapes in the box and so it might be that number of shapes is the rule or there might be loads of white shapes or loads of black shapes and I also feel like if you lean back a little bit it kind of calms you down because when you're just like crouched over the screen looking for all the fine details it can get you really panicky and really stressed when you can't find it take a breath lean back look at it as a whole and the rule might just come to you next let's move on to verbal reasoning and I have one massive tip for this section and it is that you shouldn't necessarily just read every single passage. In the majority of cases, it's so much more effective to just scan for keywords. So I'll work you through an example here. So let's look at this passage and this question. So what you need to do is you need to identify the keywords that are in the statements. So for example, in the top statement, nylon, stronger, polypropylene, hemp these are all key words and then you need to scan the text to find those key words so i've identified nylon and you can see that nylon is strong polypropylene so you can see that polypropylene is not as strong as nylon and basically i'm looking for the relationship between that word and strong so then i see hemp above it and i see that it says generally far stronger underneath it. And then I can see that that statement is true and the A is the correct answer. That was quite a lucky example because obviously the correct answer was just the top one that I tried, but it literally only takes about maybe seven, eight seconds to do that. And so if you just repeated that for all the statements, you would well be within your sort of 30 second time limit that you have for each question. So that's my biggest tip, but I do have two other sort of mini tips for verbal reasoning and that is don't be afraid of the can't tell option. So if you can't find substantial evidence to support a statement being true or false in the true false can't tell questions then put can't tell don't try to make assumptions from the text and think oh yeah they're implying that this statement is true if it is not clear and there's not evidence to support it being true or support it being false then put can't tell and don't be afraid to put that 
My other tip is to not assume causation. So let's say, for example, it said that people who smoke are more likely to also drink alcohol. Don't make the assumption that people are drinking alcohol because they smoke. Although those things have been found to be associated, they don't necessarily cause each other. So it might be that there's an external factor causing both of those things or something else. So don't assume causation. So finally, let's talk about situational judgment. My first tip is to learn the things that are always going to be inappropriate. So things like deliberately lying to and misleading a patient, covering up a mistake or not admitting to being wrong or not realising your limitations and then trying something that's really dangerous. Breach and confidentiality obviously is always going to be a big one, but check the circumstances when it is okay to breach confidentiality because there are a few situations where you can. And if you know what all of these really inappropriate things to do are, whenever they come up, it can just pop up a little red flag in your head and you can just think immediately, okay, that is a very inappropriate thing to do. Second tip is to remember that doing nothing is often not necessarily an appropriate thing to do. So for example, if a medical student friend made a really rude joke in front of a patient, it will probably never be the right thing to just do nothing and just let it pass. You always have to either apologise to the patient, raise it to a senior, confront the person who made the joke, and different ones of those will be more appropriate in different situations maybe, but it will probably never be okay to just do absolutely nothing nothing. Following on from that, my second tip is to not assume that raising something to a senior is always going to be a very appropriate thing to do. This is a mistake that I made so much when I started practicing situational judgment questions because whenever it came up to raise the problem to a consultant or, or to tell on that medical student that lied, I always thought that was a very appropriate thing to do. But actually it's often the appropriate but not ideal option because it's often better to actually confront the situation yourself first. So for example, let's say your medical student friend told you that they had lied to a consultant about something, then often the very appropriate thing to do is to say to them, look, I don't think it's right that you lied and I think that you should tell the consultant that you did lie and you made a mistake, but not to just go straight to the consultant yourself. That would be an appropriate thing to do later on down the line, but as an initial reaction, often it wouldn't be the best thing to do. So now I'm going to talk about some more general tips in terms of the UCAT. So my first tip is to practice doing full length exams. And this is really important because the UCAT is such a fatiguing exam. You will come out of it and your brain will be so tired because you have to concentrate so hard for so long. And if you're not used to doing that, I feel like it can be such a shock and you'll find that you kind of tire out towards the later sections. So you need to get used to concentrating like that for a long period of time. This doesn't mean that every time you practice the UCAT you do a full length exam because you will just exhaust yourself but I would recommend maybe like once a week you do a full mock to see how you're doing. My next tip is to make a proper plan. Prepare for the UCAT as if you are preparing for an A-level or GCSE. This is an exam that is going to determine whether you get into medical or dentistry school or not so you really need to take this so seriously and prepare in a really systematic way. Don't just say to yourself okay I'm going to sit down every day and I'm going to do half an hour of UCAT practice. Actually have in your head what it is that you're going to do and how you're going to actually improve and get better at doing the questions. And finally, I would say to always practice in the exam conditions. So right at the start, when you're still just learning about the different UCAT questions and how to approach them, it's fine to just do some questions untimed. But I would recommend as soon as you kind of understand the techniques that you need to use to answer the questions, do them timed always. So even if you're just doing, let's say, five quantitative reasoning questions just to practice, do them timed so you can see whether you're doing them at an appropriate speed and also do them in the conditions that you're going to have in the exam. So do them with that whiteboard or that one piece of paper that you get. Do them with the on-screen calculator, with the scratch pad, with the flag button. Do it as if it is the real exam every time and then you'll really, really get used to it and your brain will get used to that sort of pressurised online environment. So now let's move on to the second part of the video. So how can you actually employ all of these techniques that I've talked about and how can you actually practice them and get really good at UCAT questions. So firstly, to be completely transparent and honest with you, the only thing that I really used was this book. I do think it is a good book in that it does explain how to approach questions and it does have obviously a lot of questions in it. The sort of updated version I think is 1250 UCAC um, practice questions. But the issue of this is that if you're just doing questions from paper you're really not simulating that UCAT environment with the timer that's counting down and the on-screen calculator and being able to flag questions and it doesn't allow you to practice those sort of very UCAT specific 
things that you're going to have to do in the exam. So having said that, something I would really recommend you using is med entry. So go and check this out online. But essentially what it is, is an online service where you can learn all of the techniques to become really good at UCAT questions and where you can practice so many UCAT questions. I literally love so many things about this website because basically the way it's been made aligns completely with all of the tips I have just told you. So for example, the first thing it has is a plan feature where you can customize your own calendar. So you can actually put activities that you want to do on each day into your own calendar so you can keep your preparation for the UCAT really focused and you can actually track your progress and you can ensure that you do all of the activities that you want to do and you do all of the mocks that you want to do before your exam day. It also has a learn section where it basically has like online modules teaching you how to perform well in the UCAT. So like this video, it gives you so many tips on how to actually approach questions with worked examples and lots of explanation, far beyond the tips that I've given you in this video. So if you're really stuck with just where to start with the UCAT and you just have no idea how to get good at it, then that feature is gonna be so useful for you. It also, of course, has thousands of questions and I mean thousands I mean over 10,000 questions and also 11 mock exams which is so important because like I said you need to be practicing those full length exams and all of these practice questions and drills and sub tests they are all timed so you're doing them to timed conditions and it also has a really clever feature so this is the timing trainer so as you're doing questions you can physically see if you're staying on track and you can see exactly how you're progressing through the questions in terms of time management but the thing that really stands out to me in med entry that I feel like no other site really has is all of the skill trainers. So basically this is about actually training your brain to be good at the skills that you need to be able to answer the questions. So rather than just doing questions repeatedly and just consistently finding them really difficult, you can actually train your brain to get good at the skills that you need. So just like the things I've talked about, so using the on-screen calculator and getting really, really fast and accurate using that calculator. And like I mentioned as well about the keyword scanning in the verbal reasoning section, so actually practicing scanning words and getting really really quick at that because if you just practice that skill on its own then when you come to do verbal reasoning questions you will find that you can get your answers so much quicker. So basically the reason why I love Medentry is that it's just an all-in-one package with just everything enabling you to plan, learn, practice and it exactly simulates the UCAT exam. So where for example like in this book um, it's not online and it doesn't have the on-screen calculator, it doesn't have the flag feature, it doesn't look like the UCAT. Medentry actually completely simulates the UCAT so it will be as if you're sitting the exam every single time that you go to practice. And as well as all of the stuff in the online package that I've just talked about, you can also on top of that pay to do a two-day workshop so you can actually have someone teach you how to approach the questions. And just to top it all off, it also has an app so you can actually just practice like on the go. I know there are other sites out there but the thing that I'm so passionate about is that I feel like as prospective medical students you shouldn't have to spend hundreds and hundreds of pounds on a course to be able to take the UCAT and that again is why I love Medentry is that it's really really affordable and I honestly believe that Medentry is better but it's also cheaper than other things that are out there. If you do want to use Medentry then head to the description because I actually have a discount link so if you follow that link and you do want to sign up you will get a discount. Medentry also has loads of free resources so if you want to go and just check them out then go ahead and do that. So I hope this video has been helpful. I honestly really want to help you all with the UCAT because I know how much of a daunting exam it was to go into for me, especially as I came from a state school where literally no one mentioned the UCAT at my school. No one really told me that I had to do it. No one gave me any kind of insight into what I would need to do to prepare. So I really do feel like as a medical student who has done the UCAT and has gone through that and has struggled with it, to be honest, really want to help you make your preparation way more seamless than mine was. If you do have any questions at all about the UCAT or you're just worried about it, then feel free to leave a comment down below or you can message me on Instagram and I will really endeavour to get back to all of you and help you as much as I possibly can. Remember to subscribe to my channel for more medical school application tips and how to be successful in med school and obviously an insight into medical school itself. And best of luck everyone for your UCAT exam. I hope they all go so, so well and I will see you very soon for my next video. Bye!